This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 12th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast for our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past ep- episodes of the weekly top three, also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, in response to a discussion on last week's show, we do a deep dive into the 10-year outlook for Alaska state revenues and spending. It's not a pretty picture. Second, we discuss what the ultimate goal should be in the coming oil tax debate. And third, we discuss whether the governor should veto anything less than a full PFD. And now, let's join Michael. Let's kick things off here and get started. You dove down into uh, some of the numbers here. You, you know, you were talking last week uh, about, uh, you know, about the the revenue and you know having fine. Can we cut enough to get it in the new revenues? And you know, can we cut our way to success essentially? And you actually pulled the numbers out and took a look at them. What did you discover? Well, during during the conversation last week, you you made a statement that that I reacted to, but realized I needed to understand better. Your statement was, "Can't we cut back to? Can't we just go back to the to the 2006 uh, spending levels? Uh, isn't there a way to get?" Uh, uh, spending down to match current revenues, sort of regardless of what current revenues are, and you threw out F, uh, fiscal year 2006, which is the last, I mean, a lot of people use that, it's the last year before we started having the ACES run-up, before we started having uh, the ACES revenues, uh, Governor Palin using those revenues to in the legislature to spend on all sorts of things, and that sort of has continued from fiscal year 2007 forward. So fiscal 2000, fiscal Fiscal year 2006 is sort of a baseline that a lot of people go back to, um, and you went back to it last week. I actually hadn't – I had spent a, a lot of time in those numbers, but I'd never done it in the way that that you really – that one really needs to walk through it to fully appreciate um, – uh, what would happen if we went back to that if we went back to that baseline and so during the course of the week I, I did that I've got the resulting chart up on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page uh, if people want to uh, walk through it with me but basically what I did was compare current revenues or look at current revenues um, uh, and uh, against the FY 26 uh, 2006 baseline and there's a couple of things that I discovered in the process. Uh, one, um, <laughs> whether intentional or not, I've never heard it articulated this way, but whether intentional or not, the governor's initial budget, the governor's uh, initial FY 2020 budget, is in fact the fiscal year 2006 baseline um, uh, adjusted for inflation. Uh, when you look at those two numbers, when you look at the governor's fiscal year uh, initial budget, uh, the one he came out with in January, the one where he made all of the initial cuts that got all that started all the pushback. Right. Uh, those numbers are virtually identical. They're within five million dollars, which is which is trivial, insignificant. They're within five million dollars of the 2006 uh, numbers, um, uh, escalated for inflation. So that, that was, that was one revelation that I really hadn't, uh, hadn't focused on before. But when you go, when you go through those numbers here, here's, here's sort of where you come out for fiscal year, 2020, taking the fiscal year, 2006 numbers and adjusting them for inflation, you come out to a spending level of about $3.7 billion. It's $3.682 billion. The traditional revenues, so keep that in mind, $3.7 billion. The traditional revenues this year, 
uh, and that is the revenues from oil plus from the other existing taxes, which are about $500 million a year, uh, plus uh, the non-permanent fund investment. Uh, we have all these various savings accounts that we have. They, they are invested in, and produce returns. The, the traditional revenues are $2.3 billion. So that's traditional revenues of $2.3 billion against FY26 adjusted of 3.6. Right. Add to that uh, the the government government share of the POMV draw. So the POMV draw is 5.25 percent this year. is 5.25 percent of the permanent fund value. Uh, you have to subtract from that. Applying the statute, you subtract from that the amount that should go to the PM uh, PFD, and then the leftover. The amount remaining from the POMV draw under the statutes, the amount remaining from the POMV draw after deducting the PFD, uh, is available for government. That's sort of the that's sort of the the way we've come to Hammond's 50/50 now, uh, applying the statutes. So that's about uh, that's about another billion dollars. So 2.3 traditional, uh, add the billion dollars for the way the statutes work right now. Uh, on uh, on what's available to government out of the PF out of the PO out of the permanent fund draw, and you get to about 3.3 billion dollars. So, FY 20, 2006 um, is about 3.6 about 3.7 billion uh, in spending. Adding the adding the 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 remainder for government on top of traditional revenues that gets us to 3.3 billion. We're still 400 million dollars uh, short. Uh, of, ha of of current revenues meeting even 2006 uh, adjusted for inflation, 2006 spending levels. One other adjustment you can make to that is is instead of looking at uh, the the p the 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 permanent fund draw as uh, as the leftover approach, the current statutory approach. Some people have said that they would be some people have said that they would be satisfied with going to 50-50 of POMV. Um, and that would add another, if you did that, what that would do is take the POMV draw, which is 5.25% of the permanent fund, and split that evenly, 50% to the PFD and 50% uh, to government. Um, and that would add an additional amount uh, uh, for government. It would take some away from the PFD, but it would add an additional amount uh, for government, and it would implement a 50-50 approach to the statutory to, to to the POMV. That would add an additional amount, and the and the sum total for FY20 um, of, of of adopting that approach would give you about 3.8 billion dollars in revenues. So if you did that, you now have enough revenues for FY20 to pay for uh, FY2006 spending levels adjusted for inflation. But the problem with that, and, and, and the reason we dug into the numbers is, as, as we've talked about on the show before, you have to really look at these things over the long term as opposed to one-year shots because, because you really need to understand what the implications are of what you're changing um, uh, in any given year on, on subsequent years. So doing all that, even going to POMV, 50-50 uh, of POMV, uh, as – the 2006 spending level, or as the governor's original budget um, uh, escalates for inflation, uh, the revenues aren't keeping up with inflation. So by the time you get to uh, uh, 2023, for example, you know, which is just what four years out, by the time you get to 2023, revenues, the leftover approach, the current statutory approach, revenues are at 3.1 billion, but spendings at even the the, the FY. 2006 adjusted for inflation, that spending level is at 3.9 billion. So you're 800 million dollars uh, short. If you go to, to POMV 50/50, if you if you take 50% of the of the POMV draw, you're at 3.8 billion. You're closer to the 3.9 billion dollars in spending, uh, but you're still not there. And and the situation deteriorates. The farther deteriorates further, the farther out in the 10, pe 10 year period, farther out in the future uh, you go. That's just taking the FY 2006 spending levels or the governor's initial budget. If you look at what's really going on, if you look at the governor's first veto budget, for example, 
He sent the bud initial budget to the legislature. The legislature added a bunch on, sent it back to the governor. The governor vetoed a bunch of that, but didn't veto it back down to the initial uh, his initial budget. Uh, in fact, he left about $300 million, plus or minus, uh, of addbacks in uh, uh, his first veto budget. Uh, looking at FY20, for example, the uh, the leftover approach, the statutory approach, gives you about $3.3 billion in revenues. Spending under the first veto budget is $4 billion, so you're about $700 million short. And that deteriorates um, uh, over time as you look through the through the 10-year period. By the time you get to 2025, for example, uh, revenues under the statutory approach, approach are $3.4 billion, spending is 4.4 billion, so you're a billion dollars short uh, by uh, under the first veto budget. You're a billion dollars short by by FY uh, 2025. The point of all that is, I mean, the discussion we had last week was, can't we reduce spending down to whatever revenues are? Do we need to be looking at uh, additional revenues? And and the answer to that is, even if you go back. Even if you reduce spending all the way back to FY 2006 le uh, spending levels, adjusted for inflation, even if you accept, or put another way, even if you accept the governor's initial budget uh, uh, that he initially put out, that was after, you know, he didn't have any constraints on him. He could cut anything you want. Even if you accept the governor's initial budget, uh, there is not enough revenues coming out of traditional sources uh, plus the, the statutory leftover, plus plus the leftover from the, the POMV draw. And even if you change the POMV draw, even if you change the PFD draw to 50-50 of the POMV, even if you make that one adjustment, you still don't have enough revenues uh, to cover uh, uh, FY2006 spending levels uh, adjusted for inflation. And that still doesn't affect the. That still doesn't uh, calculate the impact of losing that much of the PFD from the economy and et cetera, et cetera. There's a ripple effect here. Yep. So, so it's it's. I mean, I I, I said last week, and what you were challenging challenging me about when we got into this discussion was, we the discussion needs to be about revenues. I mean, we don't have enough revenues to support spending. Now, I know I get blasted on this every day. Uh, on Facebook and on Twitter and, and, and in conversations with people, I get blasted on every way. Well, it's just easy. Just cut the budget down to whatever revenues are. The governor had had a free shot at doing that with his initial budget. A lot of people have said, well, let's go back to, to 2006 levels. Uh, it doesn't do it. I mean, th there's not enough revenues there to, to, to cover the spending, even if you go back to the governor's, even if you go back to the, the budget where he had a free shot, and even if you go back uh, to 2006 levels, there's not enough revenues there. And when you layer on reality, which is which is really the first veto budget, and we're about to get to a second veto budget that will have spending even higher, maybe not that much higher, but still higher than the first, first veto budget, when you layer on that reality of working through the legislative process and what the governor is handed and what he does with it after he's handed it, uh, you have an even greater uh, uh, deficit uh, between between revenues and spending. So, yes, I mean, I, I know people say it every day. We'll just cut spending down to whatever revenues are. But the political reality that we live in uh, is that that's not going to happen. And and we're either going to continue down this road, and this is what the governor's 10-year plan said back in March. We're either going to continue down this road where we're going to continue to have this debate and paper over the difference, but differences by by further drawing down savings uh, or fiscal reserves, and now we're into and now we're into the permanent fund, the the earnings reserve account of the permanent fund, as we draw down additional savings because we've gone through uh, 16 billion dollars between the SBR and the CBR uh, over the past seven years. We're we're either going to draw down savings or we're finally going to step up and face up to the situation we put ourselves in uh, over time, which is revenues don't match uh, spending. So I so I, 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 I took to heart the discussion we had last week about right. this issue, delved into it, and, and that's sort of where you come to. We do need to be talking about revenues. 
So and so in your poli- and so your political re- your political gut check here and your political reality that you're saying is that there's just not the political will to cut back far enough to make to make those numbers noodle out uh, essentially that that they are saying uh, or that you're saying that no the, the the people of Alaska have become accustomed to this level of spending and there's no like you said the governor did have a free shot now it was the first time that anybody's any governor in Alaska has really done like a zero base type budget. But essentially, there's just not the political will to cut back far enough. You would have to cut back below 2006 levels to even have a shot at having this be balanced over the long haul. Yeah. To get FY20 balanced, you have to go back to something like 2003, uh, escalated uh, uh, by or adjusted for inflation. Uh, And even then, over the 10-year period, you still overrun. Um, uh, the revenues aren't sufficient to, 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 to match uh, even that spending level. So it, it lack of, I, I guess, yeah, it is a lack of political will. I mean, I mean, presumably somebody could come in and say, well, I don't care. I mean, I'm just going to cut everything um, uh, until I match whatever that, whatever that, that revenue number is. But we, we elected a governor who said he was going to, who said pretty much he was going to do that. And and not only did his initial budget not get there, but now that we're going through the political process of the legislature having a having a voice in this and pushing back with with ad backs and the governor taking that into account in 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 the vetoes, um, uh, it, it, we're, we're coming out with spending levels uh, that are higher. Uh, and if you look at over the 10 year period, as I said, by 2025, we're a billion dollars short again. Uh, in in revenues, even even going to even going to POMV fifty fifty, we're a billion dollars short, uh, well, nearly a billion dollars short in 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 revenues sufficient to, to to cover that spending. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, <clears throat> and I think what we're looking at right here is kind of uh, you know it kind of lines out exactly what we've been talking about, how we have become dependent on this state. Uh, on a lot of that government spending, even those who, again, are conservative, uh, and th- this is my takeaway from it, Brad, not not Brad's takeaway, but even those who are conservative, we still hear, oh, yes, cut the programs, but don't cut my programs. And this is the bastard stepchild of that kind of school of thought where we have grown beyond what we is. And the, the chart we just had, because I had this chart up while Brad was speaking, for those of you who are listening on the radio, you can go back and take a look at it on the uh, on the, on the the uh, replay. But I had that chart up, and you could see that it doesn't matter if we cut back to that level, even back to 2003, the simple rate of inflation and the factor of government growth, which happens inexorably, is going to drive us into a deficit situation no matter what because, again, I think it is a matter of political will. I think it's a matter of nobody wants it to be in their backyard. Brad and I have talked about that uh, ad nauseum, I think, on this program. Which leads us over to our second talking point of the day, which is the oil tax debate. Uh, Brad, you've been accused of protecting the oil company, being a shill. You've you've said things, although you have said some things that I think uh, – most oil company people would shudder at, which is there's still some money on the table. These things can still be revisited. Um, you and I may disagree on how much is available there, but you you do say that there is still some skin in the game that could be could be locked off, but not willy nilly. Give us your thoughts here on uh, starting this oil tax debate since it seems to be hot and heavy in all quarters now. Well, I think I think the first segment leads into the second segment. The first segment was. We don't have enough revenue, uh, and we've got to, and and and, and we got to have a revenue discussion. Once we get there, I, I think oil has to be part of part of the discussion. It's been six years since we passed SB 21. Five years since it was approved uh, by the voters by uh, uh, by the defeat of the the repeal uh, effort, and and it's it's time uh, to look at at oil taxes again. I it, it's time because. We need revenue, and that's been one of our revenue sources, and we need to go look at all of our revenue sources uh, to see if they're contributing uh, to the extent they can. Uh, and after five years, it's time to, to look and see if what you did five years ago, it's a, it's a good time to look and see if what you did five years ago um, is, is still valid. As we go into this discussion, though, I think it's important, before we get down into the weeds uh, of the discussion, I think it's important 
to talk about what criteria we're going to apply as we get into this discussion. And with oil taxes, um, I think it's I think it's critically important to to, to get the criteria right uh, going in to to know what you're looking for. Oil oil companies are not an ATM. It's not a, a, a an automatic teller machine. It's not it's not a situation where we need more money. Uh, and we ought to go, you know, just go to the ATM and and withdraw more cash. That's not that that's not the right way to look to look at at oil companies. The right from from Alaska's perspective, forget the oil companies. From Alaska's perspective, the way you need to look at a tax structure is what's the most I can take without driving their investments to other to other areas because it's no longer as it's no longer um, uh, attractive to make investments in Alaska. I've taken too much to the state side, uh, and I've pushed those investments other uh, other places. The reason investment is so important, the reason that criteria uh, is so important, is investment determines future revenue levels. Um, investment leads to development. Investment in in exploration and production leads to development, uh, leads to production, and then leads to future revenues. If you, we found, and we found this out during ACES, if you, if you, if the state, if a government takes too much and drives investment someplace else, uh, that lack of investment translates into lack of development, translates into lack of future production and future revenues. Essentially what you're doing by overtaxing now is you're taking a bunch of money into this generation, but you're taking it out of future generations. Uh, by reducing investment and reducing uh, long-term production and thus long-term revenues. So you, you've, you've, you've got to be very aware of what you're doing uh, in terms of your effect on investment, ongoing investment, uh, when you make taxation decisions. That's exactly the process that, that we went through in 20, 2011, 2010 was really started, 2010, 11, 14, in looking at the is the question was, what's the right tax level? What's, what's the most we can take without driving that investment elsewhere? And as we get into uh, this review uh, of the taxation structure, that's the that's the perspective we need to take. That's not just my opinion. Uh, I, I you may have up on the uh, up on the slide uh, up on uh, up on the uh, Facebook page. The slide that I'd sent you, which was the last presentation on oil taxes given by Ken Alper, who is the director of the Division of Tax uh, in the Walker administration. The Walker administration was not known as being particularly friendly to oil companies, but this is what this is what Ken said, what the Walker administration said about uh, about oil taxes. It said oil and gas taxation should be based on fair share and related economic development issues, not budgetary need in any specific year. Major oil and gas tax changes should be backed by substantial analysis and review looking at both unique local factors as well as global comparables. That, that's sort of, those, those are sort of the buzz, buzzwords for looking at uh, what you can take without, uh, without impairing investment. So I, that's, that's the starting point that we need to have. Now, a lot of us are gonna have different opinions from that point forward, but that's sort of the of the touchstone that we need to be coming back to each time we have this discussion. What can we take without impairing investment? Because impairing investment is just a tax on future Alaskans. And and whatever we do in this situation, we need to be we need to be certain that we're being fair between the current generation taking all that we can and future generations leaving enough uh, for the oil companies to incentivize investment to deliver uh, those future uh, future production and future revenues. Well, and I got to tell you that this leads me to along another train of thought along the same lines of, you know, if we're looking at broad-based taxation on the citizens of the state of Alaska, how much can we take out before we damage the economic engine? And I think you and I have talked about that number, and it's right around that $600 million mark. And so the problem is, is that even if we took $600 million in broad-based taxes from the citizenry in the form of some kind of broad-based tax, and we were able to claw out another two or $300 million from the oil companies on top of that, I'm looking at your numbers here, but going back to uh, going back to the 2028 and that, that big number that you just threw out there, and we're still in the hole in 10 years. 
I mean, that's a serious issue. It is a serious issue. And, and, and we need to be looking at ways, at, as we look at revenues, we need to be looking at ways to incentivize Alaskans to put pressure on their legislature to reduce spending. I, some people said, well, cutting the PFD would, would, would create enough pressure on legislators to reduce spending. It hasn't. And the reason it hasn't is because it doesn't affect all Alaskans the same. The top 20% pay a fraction of their of their income in terms of PFD taxes, in terms of the PFD cuts, while it hits middle and lower income Alaskans very hard. We need to create, it, as we're going through this process, we need to keep in mind that whatever system we create should be a system that creates an equal incentive on all Alaskans to push back on spending. And the way you do that is to make sure all Alaskans are hit equally and, and hit equal, equally as hard from any increased spending. That way, that way they're all equally incentivized uh, to push back on spending. And this, again, goes back to your argument about a broad-based tax where everybody has skin in the game and uh, the discussion can continue in that. And the deeper we get into this, and I really appreciate you digging into those that first set of numbers on the first one where you took a look at the escalation, simply of the, the escalation of government in general, uh, just for, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, inflation, cost of living, just its inexorable growth is showing to me that even if we have, again, six or seven hundred million dollars in broad based taxation, plus some money from the oil companies, I mean, we're still we, we are living way beyond our means and nobody seems to want. I mean, the, the rank and file people on the street who are telling you cut, cut, cut want to believe that, but you get down there into the political reality of even some of the more conservative uh, legislators, and they're all saying, well, um, we'll cut, but just not this program, because that one's important to me. Yeah, we just saw that We just saw that yesterday, right, with senior benefits. I mean, we saw uh, the governor uh, uh, cut across the board, his first veto package cut across the board, uh, didn't didn't cut back to FY 2006 levels, but 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 cut across the board, and now we're getting pushback. Um, and frankly, this is from the Republican minority is 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 what's going on with these senior benefits. I mean, right, because they're getting killed on it politically. Right, and and what the governor's what the governor did was count noses on on whether he would get whether his veto veto would be upheld on the second the second time through and the republican minority is telling him no they're not going to vote with him on on senior benefits so he doesn't have 16 he's not he's not going to veto it again that's basically what happened yesterday so we're, we're getting pushback um uh e as you said even from conservative legislators who are saying we can't go we can't go any deeper uh than certain of these areas um and so and so we're coming i mean we're coming to the point where we, we've got to address new revenues. We're going to have to address new revenues. We've got constraints uh, on, on, on those revenues in terms of, from the oil company standpoint, in terms of, of keeping investment in the state, as you said, from the, from the populace, in terms of not driving people uh, uh, out of the state. Uh, we've got constraints from the revenue side. That really, uh, to me, that means we need to be very careful as we go through this and make sure whatever revenue uh, measures we come up with, because we are going to have to come up with some, whatever revenue measures we come up with, create an incentive to keep spending down. Uh, eliminate free riders. Eliminate a portion of the populace from, uh, from, from feeling no effects of, of increased spending. Make sure everybody has, has uh, skin in the game. Because if we don't do that, I mean, we're seeing right now what happens if we don't do that. A portion of the populace, the top 20 percent, keeps pushing for increased spending or maintained spending because they don't they don't have any consequences from it. Somebody else is going to pay for it. Right. right. You disagree with me on the sixteen hundred dollar PFD. I'm getting clarification in the chat room, by the way. Um, Lynn McCabe says I'm a member of the Save the PFD and we as a group absolutely did not say to accept the sixteen hundred dollars. Mark said he differentiated his opinions from the group. The headline is misleading. The ADN is misreporting, which for me is is a is a, a, a piece of good news. But you disagree with my thoughts on this, uh, Brad. So give me your give me your take on what's going on. Well, the PFD ultimately is about money. It's it's ultimately about about taking getting a portion of the state's resource wealth uh, into the hands of its citizens. 
and this is we're not in a perfect situation. I mean, I'll be the first. I'll, I'll be the. I'll be at the head of the line to to agree we're not in a perfect situation. We're not in a perfect situation about the amount. Uh, the statute would call for three thousand uh, dollars. We're talking about sixteen hundred dollars, and we're not in the perfect situation with respect to. Uh, with respect to how it's being funded, your point about the fact that it's being funded uh, out from places other than uh, the earnings reserve account uh, in this particular budget. But at the end of the day, the PFD is about is about getting ha- getting dollars in the hands of Alaska citizens and 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 getting those dollars into the economy through the hands of a Ala- through the decisions made by Alaska citizens. And to me, vetoing that sixteen hundred dollars, um, is uh, is 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 it, it, we're, we're going to take a billion do- a billion dollars out of the hands of of Alaska citizens, and we're going to take a billion dollars plus the knock the 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 the, the knock on effect, the follow through effect uh, out of the hands of the Alaska economy. And I just I I just think that's a bad decision. The governor the governor should lead, and he has been leading by saying three thousand by by pushing for three thousand dollars. He should continue to push for three thousand dollars, and he will continue to push for three thousand dollars. But the legislature, under under the Supreme Court's decision on how the PFD is is interpreted and applied, the legislature has to follow, <laughs> and the legislature has not followed. It's on the legislature, it's not the governor. The governor's done everything he can do uh, to push a three thousand dollar PFD, but the legislature has to appropriate that amount, and the fact is they haven't. So for the governor to veto it for the the governor to say, "Well, I didn't get my thousand dollars. I didn't get it in the right way, and so I'm going to veto it and 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 hope that the legislature comes back, sees the error of their ways, uh, and passes a three thousand uh, dollar PFD." That's that's betting a lot on the legislature suddenly getting religion and doing the right thing, and I don't think that's a good bet. So to veto it and to and to and to remove that sixteen hundred dollars to take it down to zero. Um, uh, betting that the legislature uh, does something different is to take that billion dollars out of the out of the hands of Alaska citizens and the Alaska economy, betting on the legislature doing something different. I, so, so what the governor has to do is veto it, call the legislature back into session, and say pass that three thousand dollars. The legislature has shown every inclination to say no. We're gonna it's gonna be sixteen hundred, um, and and then you know then we're right back in the same place. Um, and 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 hopefully, uh, if we, that, I hope we don't go that direction. I hope we sixteen hundred and then continue for the remainder uh, uh, through discussions session, uh, a, a next year's legislative session where you can do a supplemental. Uh, but if we go through the process and the legislature comes back and says, "Nope, we met sixteen hundred," uh, uh, then all we've done is delay injecting that billion dollars into the economy. So. so I guess I understand all the problems. I understand all the all the issues. It's not three thousand dollars. It's done in the wrong way. It's pulling from the wrong accounts. But at the end of the day, it's money, um, and it's a billion dollars into our economy. And I think we, I think the governor ought to take that as a down payment, uh, and then go forward uh, from there. You just you just laid laid out a chart that showed me the eight year ramifications of you know not cutting the budget or cutting even cutting it back to two thousand and six, and you said taking the long view. So quickly here in the next 60 seconds, give me your long view of what happens uh, in the decoupling of the PFD from the earnings reserve account um, and, and how this gets spun. Well, it, it it's just this year's budget, right? I mean, there's there, nobody's making permanent decisions about, about how the funding is going to work. There is no constitutional amendment on the floor. There is no, the, all of this goes into the 2020 election. The governor, to, for the governor to be successful the governor has to lead. We haven't had a governor that's done that. We now have a governor that's done that, but we have to have a legislature that follows. And 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 this legislature has demonstrated they're not going to follow down this road. It goes into the 2020 election. I think the long-term view of this is that we get through this year, we survive this year. The governor continues to press for three thousand dollars. Maybe he finds leverage points that we get where we get to three thousand uh, dollars through a supplemental. Uh, but it all goes into the 2020 election. I'm still very concerned about the long-term effects of decoupling. Um, I mean, the, the 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 bottom line is is that there's still plenty to beat 
all these legislators with, whether he vetoes it or not. There's plenty to beat these legislators with come election time because they could be the ones that could be said they're the ones that voted to cut. Uh, there's still a lot of political fodder to be made here, um, which, I mean, makes me feel dirty saying it, but that's kind of that's the way the game is played right now. And unfortunately, that's where we're going to end up being. Uh, I, I'm not con- I'm not 100 percent convinced yet. I understand what you're saying. And like I said, I would hate to have had to make this decision because I still don't know what my reaction would be if I held the veto pen on this. Uh, my, my probably my knee jerk reaction would be to cut it and tell them, send them all back to the drawing board. But again, that could get us a zero dollar dividend for this year. And then what, where would we be? Yeah, exactly. I, th- this is ultimately, this is about what's best for our Alaska citizens in the Alaska economy, putting a billion dollars in their hands. Uh, and with the knock on effect, more than a billion dollars in the economy, putting that money in their hands is, is critically to me, the, the critically important thing. And yeah, how the sausage has been made is not perfect. There ought to be more sausage. The governor should keep pushing for that. But ultimately, it's in the hands of the legislature. And I would take, and if it were me, I would take that billion dollars and put it into the economy and then keep fighting for the remainder. Well, and I think, again, this strengthens our argument again for that constitutional uh, amendment to formulate the and, and, and constitutionalize the PFD, put all that stuff in there, keep the spending cap in there, uh, get all these constitutional amendments put forward to the people and then see where the people stand on this. I think that would be yeah. I mean, that's really the ultimate answer to this to this problem right now. It is. It is. I, I agree with that. We got a long way to go between here and there, uh, though, and taking a billion dollars out of the economy in the meantime, I think it's going backwards while we're while we're trying to get to the long game. Yeah. No, I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. You can find him on Facebook. I uh, just realized I didn't actually link the uh, – but Brad's name is linked at the top of the screen there. You can click on that and follow it over to Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. All right, Brad, thanks so much for coming on board and joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.